get ready to journey with us to Greyhawk. It's legendary in the world of D&D. And we're diving deep into it today. Not just any fantasy world. This is like where so much began. And you listeners, you've given us a ton. Articles, maps, even pieces of those old editions. So uh, let's map this whole thing out together. What do you say? I'm in. We'll dig into how Greyhawk went from, you know, just a dungeon to the D&D world. It's shaped campaigns, players for generations. It's like but. stepping into a time capsule, you know, okay. filled with like the DNA of D&D. And to guide us on this journey, you brought a, uh, what, you brought an in-depth exploration of Greyhawk. I did. By three orcs. By three orcs. And they really go deep on how Gary Gygax's own campaigns, his personal game, like evolved into this world that we know. It's fascinating. It really is. This wasn't a world built you know, on a whiteboard, right? meticulously planned. It was forged in the fire of actual gameplay. Okay, so for those of us just starting our adventures in Greyhog, paint a picture for us. Okay. How did those early games, like, blossom into a full-fledged world? Okay, so picture this. Early 70s, no internet, and Gary Gygax is running a game right there in his kitchen. This wasn't some big planned out world, was it? It, like, emerged from those sessions under Castle Greyhawk itself. Yeah. It's almost like an urban legend, but true. Those games weren't about sticking to a script. They were about discovery. Every room in Castle Greyhawk, when they cleared it, led to something new. The world just grew from that. I can practically imagine those players all gathered around, no clue they were shaping fantasy gaming forever. But how did they go from one dungeon to a whole planet? Or Earth, right. With Greyhawk as just one part, that's a leap. Well, Gydax, the ultimate dungeon master, he knew how to raise the stakes. Players beat goblins, boom, rumors of a lost city, an ancient temple. It just kept growing. That's collaborative storytelling at its finest. And talk about collaboration. There's that story about the Flannus, the most famous part of Greyhawk, right? Yeah. How a printing problem made it the center of everything. Too perfect. Tell me. It shows how creativity can take these weird turns. Gygax, he first imagined this huge continent, Auric. Greyhawk was just one piece. But when they went to print the map, the plates, they weren't big enough for all of Auric. So instead of shrinking everything, he focused on what fit, which was the Flannis. Exactly. And this wasn't just any area. It became the area. Details, intrigue, adventures that hooked players for years. It's wild how limitations can spark creativity. Yeah. you got to make each detail count. And speaking of details, Greyhawk's not just geography, is it? It's the characters that make it real. we got to talk about Morden Kynan, Gygax's own character, who became more than the game. Mordenkainen is the perfect example of how player choices they could echo. Here's this wizard, powerful, who begins as a player character and winds up inspiring spells, shaping the entire game, like those early players were weaving their legends into the world. D&D had a huge impact on my life. I started playing in grade school after Star Wars came out in 1977, where I started a gaming club that led to D&D. At the time, I would be found in a classroom, keeping my head low, buried in a fantasy book. The D&D blue box set changed and consumed my life. Quickly after that, I bought the AD&D Player's Handbook by Gary Gygax, which had a massive influence on me. I highly recommend these books to read. Rise of the Dungeon Master, Gary Gygax and the Creation of D&D by David Kushner and Corin Sadmi. This graphic novel is a quick read, and it is a brief glimpse into the life of Gary Gygax, the creation of D&D, the controversy, and the effects that the game had on pop culture and the many lives that it touched. The next book is Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the Birth of Dungeons and Dragons by Michael Whitwer. I found that this biography is a series of fictional vignettes about events in Gary Gygax's life, loosely connected by nods at context, which is more of an inspired by true events story than an actual biography. And the last one is Of Dice and Men, the story of Dungeons and Dragons and the people who play it by David Ewalt. This was a fun read about the history of Dungeons and Dragons. The author injects that some scenes from one of his own D&D campaign, which, is, which I liked, but sometimes it strayed a bit, a little bit too far from the subject and covered a lot of other role-playing games. I was really happy to identify with a lot of the scenes in this book and not just from playing the game. You can find my affiliate links down below. Okay, but we can't forget the Circle of Eight. It's D&D's Justice League, right? Kind of. This council of wizards, all about keeping the world balanced, 
started as Gygax's own players. They became this force fighting huge threats, adding this whole other layer to Greyhawk. Makes you wish you were there. <laughs> Speaking of which, how did Greyhawk reach those of us who weren't in Gygax's basement? That's where those published modules come in. Portals, straight into Greyhawk. Not just adventures, but like windows into its core. They'd reveal regions, monsters, let players experience it firsthand. And some are legendary. Against the Giants. The Temple of Elemental Evil. Those weren't dungeon crawls, they were mini-campaigns, weren't they? Game changers, for sure. They took D&D adventures to a new level, out of the dungeons, into these huge connected regions, yeah. intrigue, challenges. That's when Greyhawk truly became the D&D world. These were woven right into Greyhawk, weren't they? For anyone who wasn't there for it, what made them so special? Well, they were amazing adventures, of course. But it's more than that. They made those places, those encounters, feel real, like part of a living world, you know? Against the giants, it wasn't just smash the big thing. It had this huge scope, like a conspiracy across the whole place. Mountains to frozen wastes all linked together. And let's not forget the loot. Everyone remembers that one magic item they had to have. Nay. Did Against the Giants have that effect back then? Totally. Players wanted those weapons, the armor, all that giant-made stuff. But beyond even the treasure, Against the Giants changed how we saw campaigns. Not just clearing a dungeon, but stuff that could affect, like, whole regions. Now that's raising the stakes. Then there's Temple of Elemental Evil. <laughs> Sounds like my nightmares, honestly. Yeah. What made that one infamous? If Giants was about scale, Temple was the atmosphere. This sprawling temple all dedicated to these evil elemental princes. It just oozed dread, like something bad was going to happen. Not just the dungeon, more like a wound on the world, always threatening to break open. You're making it sound Lovecraftian. I can only imagine the horrors inside. Oh, there are plenty. Cults, monsters, and at the heart of it, Zuckmoy, the demon queen of fungi. But aside from all that, Temple was about these awful choices. Destroy it, maybe unleash worse stuff, contain it, and maybe it consumes you. Okay, now you're just messing with me. No wonder it's so notorious. That moral stuff, that's what makes an adventure memorable. But these weren't just stories, right? They gave Greyhawk some of its most famous monsters. Absolutely. Giants made giants more than dumb brutes. They had cultures, you know, hierarchies, reasons for doing stuff, made them more interesting to fight or even bargain with. No more just hit it till it falls down. I like it. They became real parts of the world, their own goals and all that. Exactly. And a temple that brought us the elemental planes, right? Salamanders, a freed, all those weird things. They weren't just there to be defeated. Each one had a place in how Greyhawk worked, made the world richer. It's amazing how those modules did so much more than just give you an adventure. Like, concentrated Greyhawk, making it deeper with each game. They were world-building lessons, showing how connected adventurers, good characters, even terrifying monsters. All that could make a setting feel real. And it's not just about the Dungeons and Dragons, right? These mm -hmm. modules, the stories, they changed D&D &D itself. No doubt. Greyhawk wasn't just background. It was where the game's rules, spells, even classes were tested out. Like what? Give me an example of something in D&D &D that came from Greyhawk. Well, some of the most famous magic items, Rod of Seven Parts, Sword of Kaz, Hand and Eye of Vecna, those didn't just appear. They started in Greyhawk, each with a whole history. Like those games were this gold mine of ideas. It wasn't just loot, was it? You said whole character classes. Right. The thief, the stealthy one, all about skills, cities that came from Greyhawk cities and the sneaky stuff happening under the surface. So every rogue in Greyhawk City, they weren't just playing, they were adding to the game. That's wild. And don't forget druids, so connected to nature, shape-shifting, talking to plants. That's Greyhawk's forests, all the wild places. Like the spirit of the place got into that class. It's incredible. This one setting, starting with a few friends around a table, changed a whole genre. This yeah. wasn't just world building. Right. It was a living, breathing campaign wow. that kept evolving with each game session. Oh, I can already see how that would lead to a different feel than a pre-planned world. Like, did that actually become part of, like, the design and feel of Greyhawk? Absolutely. This organic growth, it resulted in a world that felt real, right. yeah. lived in, full of little details and inconsistencies, you yeah. know, that only come from Things evolving over time. Yeah. Three Orcs even calls it, and I love this description, a parallel Earth. Oh, wow. Which I think is perfect. It's familiar, yet imbued with magic. Right. A place where the fantastical feels surprisingly grounded in reality. I'm hooked already. Now, I've heard whispers that even the geography of Greyhawk has a fascinating backstory. Oh, yeah. Something about printing limitations of all things. You're not mistaken. It's a tale for the ages. 
So we're talking about the Flannis. Okay. The most well-known region in Greyhawk. Hmm. Believe it or not, its size was directly influenced by the maximum printing size TSR. That was D&D's publisher back then. Oh, wow. Okay. Good handle. You're telling me the fate of an entire fantasy realm hinged on the size of a printing press? Basically. I gotta hear this. Oh, it's true. Three orcs dug up this gem. Gygax asked TSR's printing house about the maximum size of paper they could handle. The answer was 34 by 22 inches, 86 centimeters by 56 centimeters. Oh, my God. Can you imagine being told, sorry, Gary, but your world can only be this big? That's hilarious. It is now. But I imagine it wasn't so funny for Gygax at the time. Talk about limitations breeding creativity. Right. And here's the thing. Those limitations, as frustrating as they might have seemed, they ended up working in Greyhawk's favor. Really? Yeah. Instead of this vast, undefined world, right. you had this concentrated region yeah. packed with detail and adventure. The Flaness became this like crucible of creativity. And it's fascinating to think how different things might have been if those printing presses were just a little bit bigger. It makes you wonder how many other like happy accidents shaped the world of Greyhawk. Right. But we're talking about Greyhawk. Yeah. You know, a world teeming with magic and monsters. Mm -hmm. And are those player characters I see rising in the distance? Yeah. You spotted one of the things that makes Greyhawk truly special. Okay. We're not just talking about, you know, like pre-generated heroes in a book. Right. We're talking about characters born from gameplay. Okay. Characters who left their mark on this world in ways even they couldn't have imagined. I love it. Give me the highlights. Yeah. Who are these legendary figures and what makes them so iconic? Well, you can't talk about Greyhawk legends without mentioning Mordenkainen. Mordenkainen. This right. wasn't just some random wizard. Right. This was Gary Gygax's personal character. Oh, wow. And wow. get this. His level was never revealed. What? <laughs> Can you imagine the mystique surrounding that? No kidding. That's like the ultimate DM power move. Right. Don't even ask Kate what level I am. You just got to <laughs> trust me. Exactly. And Three Orcs dives into how these characters, you know, okay. shaped by both Gygax no. and the players at the table, yeah. ended up woven into the fabric of Greyhawk itself. Wow. Take Robolar, for example. Robolar. This player character okay. actually conquered the Temple of Elemental Evil. Hold on, wait a minute. The Temple of Elemental Evil. Yes. As in one of the most infamous, notoriously difficult dungeons in in DD &D history. The one and only. Oh my god. Robolar walked in, took care of business, and walked out a legend. And you can bet that victory sent ripples throughout the campaign world. Yeah. It wasn't just a dungeon crawl, it had real consequences. That's the thing I'm starting to really grasp about Greyhawk. Yeah. Is how those player actions weren't just contained within that game session. Right. It all like fed back into the world itself. Precisely. And Three Arcs reminds us that even spells. Okay. Those building blocks of D and D magic yeah. have roots in Greyhawk. What? Right. We've got Tensor, whose name is forever linked to the floating disc spell. Oh wow! It's a spell known by pretty much every D and D player. Right. And it originated in Greyhawk, oh, tied right. to a real character with their own stories. That's so cool. It's like these characters weren't just playing in Greyhawk; they were helping to build it. Yes. Brick by magical brick, which <laughs> makes me wonder. How did that collaborative spirit continue Okay, as Greyhawk like grew beyond those initial gaming sessions? That's where things get really interesting because Greyhawk wasn't just confined to Gygax's home game. Right. It leaped from those tables into the hands of players everywhere thanks to publish adventure modules. Ah, uh, yes. The modules. The modules. These were like pre-made adventures yeah. set in Greyhawk, right? Yeah. I bet those were a game changer for players and dungeon masters. Oh, yeah. Hungry for a taste of that world. Absolutely. And not just a taste, but they offered entire courses. Okay. Take Against the Giants, for instance. This classic module introduced memorable monsters right. and like sprawling locations that became staples of the Greyhawk setting. Okay, that's super cool. So it's like those modules gave DMs pre-built chunks of Greyhawk. Yes. They could just like slot yeah. right into their own oh, campaigns, like adding expansions to a video game. Or you something. got it. Okay. And it wasn't just about convenience. These modules, like the Temple of Elemental Evil, right. which I'm sure needs no introduction, yeah. they weren't just like tacked on side stories. They were yeah. woven into the lore. 
adding depth and detail to the world Gygax and his players had created. That's what I love about a shared world like this. You know, yeah. it's like everyone's contributing to this ever-growing tapestry of adventure. Yes. But I'm picking up on something else interesting here. We've got these players, these modules, all shaping Greyhawk. Yes. But where does Gygax, the architect of it all, fit into this evolving world? Okay. Was he, like, pulling strings from behind the scenes? Or did Greyhawk take on a life of its own? That's a question. That takes us to the heart of Greyhawk's legacy. You see, even though Gygax, he was the one who sparked this world into existence, right? Right. Greyhawk had a way of capturing imaginations yeah. and inspiring new stories, even when he wasn't directly involved. So even after those early games, even after those modules were published, Greyhawk kept evolving. Oh, yeah. That's kind of amazing when you think about it. It's yeah. like this living, breathing world yeah. that refused to be confined to a single creator or a single story. Exactly. And perhaps no single element better illustrates this than the Circle of Eight. Oh, eh? Have you encountered these powerful mages in your <laughs> explorations of Greyhawk yet? The name rings a bell. They're like this council of wizards, right? <laughs> Dedicated to maintaining balance in the world. That's them. But what's fascinating is they started as Gygax and his players' high hate level characters. Uh, Can you imagine that? No. Your game night buddies yeah. suddenly become this influential force in the yeah. world you created. Okay, that's some next level DMing right there. <laughs> Talk about incorporating player actions into the world. I know. But I'm guessing things didn't stay that simple, did they? You know Greyhawk, always full of surprises. Three Orcs points out how the Circle of Eight went through a transformation okay. after Gygax left TSR. Oh, wow. After Gygax was ousted from TSR, Carl Sargent and Rick Rose remolded Gygax's old Circle of Eight in the City of Greyhawk boxed set into a new plot device. It just shows how Greyhawk wasn't, you know, a static creation. Right. It was a shared universe, open to interpretation yeah. and reinterpretation. It's almost like passing the torch, you know? Yeah. One generation of storytellers handing off this incredible world to the next. Right allowing it to grow and change, right? but still retaining that core essence of what made it so special. Exactly. And for someone like you, digging deep into Greyhop's history, yeah. that's an important lesson. This isn't just about memorizing names and dates. right? It's about understanding the spirit of collaborative storytelling that birthed this world. It's like we're seeing the evolution of D&D &D itself yes. play out in the history of Greyhawk. Absolutely. From a simple dungeon crawl to a shared universe with its own rich history, right? iconic characters, yeah, and a legacy that continues to inspire dungeon masters and players to this day. And that legacy is something you can tap into directly every yeah. time you roll those dice. Right. Every time you lose yourself in an adventure, you're adding your own chapter to the ever-unfolding story of Greyhawk. It's amazing, really, to think that it all started with you know, a dungeon beneath a castle. It is. A father's desire to share something incredible with his children and friends. It's a reminder that sometimes the most magical worlds are born not from grand designs, right. but from those simple moments of shared imagination. Beautifully said. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into the world of Greyhawk. Did you enjoy video? Consider tossing support on my Patreon. It best ways to support orcs. If you would like to see more content, subscribe and post comments below. It better not be bad. Remember, the next time you're planning a campaign or just sketching out a dungeon, don't be afraid to, you know, yeah. let your imagination run wild. You never know. You might just create something as timeless and beloved as Greyhawk. Keep rolling those dice and keep exploring. Who knows what wonders await in the unexplored corners of your imagination. We'll see you on the next deep dive.